Best ever listeners, welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless. This is the world's longest running daily real estate investing podcast. We only talk about the best advice ever. We don't get into any of that fluffy stuff. We've spoken to Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank, Robert Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a whole bunch of others. And with us today, Tom Postilio and Mickey Conlon. How are you two doing? Doing great. Thanks so much. Yeah, nice to have you on the show and looking forward to diving in a little bit about Tom and Mickey. Of course, you know them. They're the stars of Selling New York, which is on HGTV, the reality series broadcast to millions and millions of people. Uh, They are brokers in New York City at the largest brokerage in New York, and they've been named the top 1,000 real estate professionals in the U.S. by the Wall Street Journal. They're responsible for nearly 2 billion, not million, billion in residential sales. And they're based in, of course, New York City, New York. With that being said, Tom and Mickey, before we dive into it, you want to give the best ever listeners a little bit more about your background and your current focus? Absolutely. We sell uh, luxury real estate here in the great metropolis of of Manhattan. And uh, we thank you for that wonderful uh, bio you just read. It's kind of a very exciting job. It's a very competitive uh, world that we live in, but uh, it's also gratifying and and we love what we do. And $2 billion is uh, a lot of transactions over a, over a collective uh, cumulative 25 years in the business between the two of us. But it adds up quickly. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, it's uh, that is a quite imp- quite an impressive number, and I mean, so I, I lived in New York City for ten years. I just recently I moved like three years ago from the city. I lived in East Village, so I, I know a bit about your market, not as clearly, not as much as you two. Um, and as you said, it is a very competitive um, market, regardless of what industry you're in. How have you two been able to stand out and be as effective as you have been? It's a great, it's a great question. Yeah. Well, I would say first off, Tom and I both come, not everybody in the real estate industry uh, starts there. That's mm-hmm. historically been the case. Many people transition from other careers because they're looking for something more, uh, a certain amount of autonomy, uh, making their own rules because uh, by nature, we're all entrepreneurs. We decide how our business is run, what our business model is. And while we exist under the magnificent uh, umbrella that is Douglas Elliman, we're still responsible for creating our, our own business. So uh, we are both creatures of show business. Tom was a singer for many years. I produced theater. And we bring that skill set to everything we do. We often joke that it's all show business. And some people have derided that as if we're minimizing the importance of a transaction. But there are two words in there. There's show and there's business. And New York is a city that's all about lifestyle. It's all about the sexiness and exclusivity and sometimes even the snobbery of it. So if we're just selling bricks and mortar, we're not going to achieve those record prices that the city is so well known for. Uh, So we add a little bit of sparkle, razzle-dazzle, and we help people to imagine their New York fantasy. Mm. Is, is, have you, um, so I, I guess the, the question that comes to mind is, as you just said, you're, you're selling the sexiness and the exclusivity. You're not selling the brick and mortar. Um, you're, you're doing, you're, it's more of a lifestyle or maybe you, I, I, I think I just misquoted you. I think you said New York city is kind of about sexy and exclusivity. Um, but, and you don't sell about you don't sell just a brick and mortar how do you do that how how do you how do you first identify what you need to sell what what angle you need to take with the property and then how to actually tactically bring that to life great question we we look at each property differently whether it's a studio apartment or an entire building that requires us to create an identity Uh, sometimes it's an entire neighborhood that requires an identity because markets don't grow out of the mist, they are created. And we look at ourselves as the people charged with creating those markets. So when we look at something, we look at it the way a director might a script. What is the story here? What is it telling us? What makes it stand out from the other apartments in that line or the other townhouses on that block? Or even the other sales, if we're going by the numbers, 
why are we going to be able to get more for this than anybody else has been able to achieve? And we create that story, and that story comes through our property descriptions, it comes through our marketing materials, and it comes right down to the very way we present a property. It really does matter in the end. We find that the people who are least successful in this business are the ones who are trying to do it by rote. They're doing something somebody else was doing. So they walk through a kitchen and they say, and this is the kitchen, which is nice. <laughs> and you know, it's like, thank you very much. Why are we paying you all of this money <laughs> to show us where the kitchen is? A, a better question is to say to somebody, do you cook? You do cook, great, let me tell you a little bit about the kitchen, I'm sure I don't need to because you're an expert at this. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's appealing to people's needs, overcoming their objections and obstacles, and to justify the pricing, because as much as there's show in our business, the business is a very important component, and nobody wants to overpay for anything. But if we can demonstrate why this opportunity is so special and what it will be worth in the future, then we've done our job successfully. If you're presented with an opportunity for a new listing in an area of New York City that you're not as familiar with as others, when, when you go to that area, what are you looking for in order to identify the way that area or property stands out amongst the com competition? I have a thought. Well, my first, my first thought, we'll see if it's the same. Okay. Sometimes we're on the same wavelength. <laughs> That's what makes it exciting. <laughs> it's about feeling the neighborhood. It's about walking the streets. It's getting, it's getting the vibe and the feel of the neighborhood, first of all. Yeah, we always, when somebody wants to explore a neighborhood that they're not used to, it doesn't start with us. It starts with them. Go walk around. Have lunch someplace. Mm -hmm. Spend an evening there. How do the streets feel at night? Uh, one of the other common questions that we get is, you know, what's the next hot neighborhood? And in New York, it's, it's like the wheel of fortune. Just spin it and it, any place you land is almost going to be the next hot neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there's some key markers we look for. You know, sometimes people are just grasping at straws because developers are building in an area. But that may be because the land was cheap, not because it's the best opportunity. Sometimes the best opportunities are kind of a confluence of many different factors. When you can uh, look at transportation or expanding transportation and see a neighborhood where that wasn't easily accessible before. That's something to look for. Look for retail. What is, which major retailers are moving into the neighborhood? Which hot new restaurants are in the neighborhood? And then suddenly when you, you, you build that infrastructure, that's your value. Mm -hmm. And you just try to get in there before the prices get skyrocket out of control. To your question, I mean, we, we, we um, have been fortunate to sell in just about every neighborhood in Manhattan, but it's interesting, on the flip side of that, we're working with a buyer right now, VIP clients who we've helped them, their family, their siblings, known them since the beginning of our real estate careers, but uh, they're looking now to sell an apartment downtown and move their family out to either you know, they're, they're exploring several neighborhoods in Brooklyn. They're exploring, uh, exploring the, um, the Riverdale section of the Bronx. They're exploring parts of Nassau County. So these are, you know, and we're following a, a, and helping with these conversations to really learn those different areas that we obviously don't do business in every day. Although in Brooklyn, we're more active than mm -hmm. uh, Bronx or Nassau County. But. When, when you are identifying the unique selling points of a particular property, how do you approach that? It's about, uh, I think, I mean, it starts with pros and cons, you know, every, every property. And we tell this to every client we work with, whether you're looking for a, a $1 million property or a $20 million property, there's always something that you kind of have to give up on. You're not going to get everything on your list, but I think uh, it, it's, it's putting the pros and cons. We, we really, we will make a list. Uh, we'll go through it together and, and, you know, accentuate the positives, as the, uh, as the song says. We, we try to break real estate, up, real estate up into its components. And uh, the, these are the ingredients in a recipe that carries us through hot markets and slower markets. So we have the real estate of necessity, and that's when somebody is just busting out of their studio, their one bedroom or two bedroom, and they need more space. They can't wait to see what interest rates are going to do. They can't wait to see where the market is going next year. They need to fulfill that need now. And that is an ever-present need in New York and in any market. Uh, the other is the real estate of desire. 
it's that penthouse, you know, the, the 50 million, the $100 million, and it's a, a pied a terre. It's, it's more of a bauble than anything else. And that market tends to be more volatile. But in the everyday market where you can combine those two things, and when you can marry necessity with desire, you, you find a way to reach your target buyer because you know, even if you just need that extra bedroom, you also have a fantasy of what that bedroom is going to do for your life. You're going to have more storage. Your kids are going to be more comfortable where they're sleeping. Uh, you have ideas about how you'll use this neighborhood. Is it near the park? Is it near shopping? So when we can touch on all of those things and listen more than we talk to our clients, that's when we can achieve a successful sale and hopefully a record-breaking sale. Mm -hmm. And that last thing you just said, listen more than you talk. Uh, earlier, there was a, a comment about the kitchen where instead of saying, here's the kitchen, asking them the question, do you cook? Uh, what are some um, tactical things, if, if you have any you can think of, and if not, that's fine, but that, that you always do when you're either with a client or presenting to a client that have helped you from a business standpoint? Complete honesty. I mean, one of the most powerful things that we can do is if we're working with a buyer, for instance, this just popped into mind from a recent experience, you're walking through a place and you know what their, what their criteria is. And of course, at the end of the day, every real estate broker wants to do a deal. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is to be completely honest to the client because it's all about it's all about referrals it's about repeat business it's, it's about doing the right thing so walking through a property i'll be the first to turn, to kind of whisper to them and say this is not for you let's go you know and, and that's that kind of honesty is absolutely absolutely important mm -hmm. and in in that scenario it, it, and, and, and was that a hypothetical or was that a real scenario where that happened, where you arrived and you said, this isn't for you, let's go? No, it, it, it has happened. It happens often. I mean, it, it's one thing for us when we, obviously we work with buyers and sellers, but when we're working with a buyer, we can look at a property on paper. You look at a floor plan, you look at the photos, you read the description, but that's all well and good. It, it's kind of the, those are the ingredients that get you to be interested and, and mm -hmm. want to go through the door. But once you're there, you can, and immediately ascertain that this is not the right property for the client. And so okay. Move on. Got it. Got it. I, I was going, I, I think, I think you just answered it, but I, I was going to ask if it was, uh, if you took them there and then you said immediately, this isn't for you. I was going to ask if they get um, annoyed by that because you took them somewhere and it wasn't a good use of their time. But that explanation you just said makes a lot of sense. Right. And typically we'll have multiple showing scheduled in a, in a period of two to three hours. So, so if you're seeing, you know, six or eight properties, there might be a couple that, that just are immediately out, you know, so mm -hmm. it's all part of the, uh, the exploration of, of the market and, and what's out there for any particular buyer. And for any buyer trying to educate themselves, it's important that they see the properties in the same price point that don't necessarily appeal to them because it gives them a more comprehensive sense of value. Mm -hmm. So when they do finally find the right one, they've learned, they've seen enough that they can feel confident in their purchase. Thinking back, you two have what, 20 plus years, right, of experience? Uh, so, no, it's just a little over 25 between the two 25. of us. I don't want to shortchange you, 25. 25, <laughs> a little, 25 plus years. How, how have you evolved from when you first got started to now in the business? My goodness. I mean, on, on day one, and we tell this to every new broker, I mean, we meet often with, with young agents who just got their license. I mean, you, it takes a year, it takes a good year to really learn the language, to be able to speak this language. And I mean, we've seen things in our collective experience that, you know, just real head scratcher situations, but you, you deal with it in real time and and you approach it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, there are still things that come up uh, for us that we, we go, okay, wait a minute, how are we going to solve this one now? You know, but can, can you give an example? Uh, an example, sure. What's, what's I'm, sure we, I'm sure we have one, maybe the, the property that we recently sold in Harlem. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, one of our favorite deals uh, in recent memory was, it was epic. It was, it started with a bidding war, that fell apart. We had uh, an accepted offer above the asking price, buyers fell off left and right, multiple inspections, different inspectors found different problems that uncovered decades of uh, open permits and violations, which held up the sale. The seller had to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into fixing a roof problem. The buyer had to invest a certain amount. Uh, very, very long story short, we encountered things uh, that even our attorneys were scratching their heads over. And at the end of the day, we were most proud of the fact that we were able to, we were representing both the buyer and the seller in this particular transaction. And we were really proud that at the end of this, nobody came out unscathed, but we remain uh, friends with both of these parties. And at the end, both were grateful. So it's not always pretty down there in the trenches, but <laughs> you know, we try to use our expertise and our past knowledge and our contacts to solve complicated problems without creating a fire drill uh, unnecessarily. We do try to buffer our clients from some of the madness. Absolutely, that, that, that's, our, that's one of our primary rules of, of our business is that there's so much drama on a day-to-day -day basis, don't, don't put it in the face of the client. Take that <laughs> drama, we are the sponge for that drama. We do this all day. <laughs> we understand the potholes and the pitfalls and the workarounds but do not put that on the client. And there were some brokers, and we've witnessed it, where, where some brokers love to get hysterical and create you know, crazy, crazy uh, scenarios. But uh, That would make for better TV. It makes, <laughs> it makes for good TV, and it makes them feel like they're earning their commission. If they go like, waving their hands and squealing a lot, it's like, because you couldn't do this without me. <laughs> what, what are some other uh, primary rules that you have that you always adhere to, or it's always top of mind? Okay, so take the drama, absorb the drama, total honesty. It's all about servicing the customer, not making a deal. It's, so, you know, do the right thing by the customer. Uh, what else would I think? I'd say, from a personal business standpoint, constantly evolve. Mm -hmm. The business evolves. Uh, as much as people would like to keep it rooted in the past, and in New York, in many ways, it is. Uh, it's, uh, it's a paper-heavy market. We do a lot of paper co-op board packages and financial reviews that aren't common to other markets, but it's something we have to deal with. And on the flip side of that, we have to deal with emerging technology. How is the industry changing? How are consumers getting their information? How are they processing that information? We sometimes laugh that you know all of these aggregator sites like Zillow, Trulia, Street Easy, they're, they're in a sense like WebMD. People have a certain amount of knowledge and they process it the best they can and you know they make determinations based on that. That's like going to WebMD saying like sweaty, feverish, you're always dying within weeks. We know, you know you're, you're, you've always diagnosed the worst possible <laughs> thing you get. And people do that with real estate data. They look at the numbers, they say, oh, well, I know what that's sold for and I know what the, but there's a lot more to it than that. So we're constantly redeveloping our business to stay in touch with our consumers and to partner with them with that technology to show them how to use it better. Because very often we'll say, at the end of the day, we may not be the people who find your perfect home. You're tuned in, you may send it to us, but we're going to show you how to get it and we'll get it for the best possible price. And we'll guide you through this process to make sure you don't endure any additional stress. When you're uh, talking to a client and they're like, m maybe that last, the house, the last um, property example where there are build bidding wars, multiple inspections, permits, violations, et cetera. And something comes up to, and uh, you have to communicate it back to the, the seller and it's say it's an, an, a, a violation or an inspection issue. How do you communicate that? Will you, and if you can, will you almost pretend that I'm the seller and there's a violation and it's going to tank my purchase or the, the purchase price? How, how do you talk to me? Any time you have to share news of that kind, I mean, it's, you know, we just take a deep breath and we go ahead and, and tell the truth. I mean, there's no, sometimes there's just no sugarcoating. Mm -hmm. and you just have to rip off the band-aid and get deep down into the issue mm -hmm. and we try to look at the issue from the buyer's perspective this is what they've discovered 
it has a dollar value. How are we going to do this? Are you, Mr. Seller, going to resolve this? Or are you going to give them cash incentive to overlook this? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's a complicated uh, road to navigate because we're not exactly sure. It could open somebody up to liability down the road, even if they simply give a discount on the price to make it go away. So again, that's some place where we like to uh, counsel buyers and sellers in those situations to figure out, well, if this issue goes away, what does that look like in six months or six years when you're going to sell it? Mm -hmm. And while it's a case by case approach, most of the time we will, we will sit down and put that in writing because it's the kind of thing that you want to give them the time to absorb. These are the facts of the matter. This is what's been found. This is how we would suggest approaching it. Please review all of this, review the attached documents if there's supporting collateral, and then let's set up a time for a call so that they're, they're not just hit with it, you know, blindsided. It's, it's here's all the information we've gathered digest and then we'll talk. Yeah, I love that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I want to briefly go back to what you mentioned earlier and that's the show biz part. And you said there's the show and then there's the biz. Can you tell us a story of how you've approached maybe a particular deal or a showing or something where you brought the show biz aspect to life? Oh boy, uh, I'm, I'm sure there were a few. There was one, uh, one transaction, one of our favorite transactions. We were representing Joan Collins in the sale of her apartment and we were the fourth brokers on that transaction. So by that time, <laughs> press or media coverage had been completely sapped up. There, there, was, there was really nothing, no meat left on that bone. Uh, and by that time, as a seller, she was becoming frustrated because she had to she was emptying the apartment. She was sending things to her home uh, in LA. And you just could, you could feel it. It was like, okay, this, we need to reinvent this show. And with zero budget, we, en we enlisted the help of a friend and designer and said, we have zero budget. What can you do to freshen this place up? And what we wound up doing is creating a, a $1 million makeover of the apartment, all with donated furniture, rugs, a piano from Steinway, and it gave it new life. It felt great. You can imagine yourself living in it. And you know, all of those, you know, all of those years on the market, we finally we had an active bidding war at, at in the last moments. And we thought, you know, that's really not common. After you've been on the market for years, we we typically say, you know, you know, it's a slippery slope of diminishing returns. You want to make a sale happen as quickly as possible. But we've sort of carved a niche out for ourselves as uh, uh, how, do, how do we put it? Uh, when people hire us, when you want to make a first impression for the second or third time. <laughs> and we did. We You're the up. closers. Yeah, exactly. So we wound up getting a lot of media coverage and that brought in, interestingly, it brought in a whole wave of celebrities who are interested in that particular property. And we mm -hmm. thought for some of them, that's not really quite the right fit for you, but it was sort of a, a tacit endorsement of the building in the neighborhood and uh, quite a success story, I'd say. So yeah, a little razzle-dazzle can go a long way. <laughs> and the, the friend that helped, helped you two out, was, is, was that friend an expert in staging? Or did they just have some muscles and they moved the, the donated furniture into the apartment? No, his name was uh, John Lyle. He's a well-noted designer. And it, okay. you know, it really took, it took a village. I mean, between the, the painters and the multiple vendors who contributed their time and effort, to make this happen, uh, it was it was kind of like something out of an MGM movie from the mm -hmm. 1940s. So everybody just banding together, we're getting this done, and everybody there is going to be part of that success story. Mm -hmm. And did they? Because I, I I think you mentioned zero budget. So is that relatively speaking, or literally zero? And all those individuals donated their time and supplies. It was a zero budget. It was complete. Everything was donated. Wow. And yeah. like the painters, they, they did it just to say they did, they worked on that place? Or? Yes, because we, you know, we don't, in, in situations like this, we like to thank everybody, whether we thank them in writing as a contributing uh, participant mm -hmm. in this effort, or where we can refer business to them down the road. Because we like to 
be able to, uh, how do I put it? When somebody needs somebody, if they need a contractor, if they need an attorney, if they need an interior designer, we like to be able to recommend people who are basically an extension of ourselves, knowing that they're going to get the same level of service. And these people went above and beyond, and that's something we really value. So we like to pay it forward in a sense. Makes sense. Based on your you two's experience, I used to say y'all, but I've moved from Texas, so now I don't say y'all. So <laughs> I don't think that there's a perfect word to substitute for y'all, though. Uh, based on y'all's experience uh, <laughs> in in real estate, what would you say is your best advice ever for real estate professionals? For, for people who do what we do? Yeah. Always be honest. Don't make things up. If, if somebody asks you a question, you don't know the answer to it, do not make up the answer because we have seen people get in so much trouble time and again. You cannot make representations that are not true. And there is nothing wrong with saying, you know what? That's a great question. Let me look into that and I'll get right back to you. Mm -hmm. I would add to that, uh, going back to show business, know your audience. Because if, let's say uh, if I'm representing a seller and I have a showing and I open that door, that's the curtain going up. Mm -hmm. who, you do, who are you dealing with? Are you giving the same performance every night? What kind of audience do you have out there? Are they, are they with you? Are they having fun? Are they slightly hostile? Are they someplace in their own heads and they're really not present for this showing? Figure that out and help to try to figure out how to break through. Mm -hmm. Because these people are probably seeing five, six or seven properties in a day and you want the experience and their short time with you to be memorable, to hopefully get them to come back. How do you break through? Let's say someone is, is lost in their own head and you can tell they're just not being as focused on the property. Maybe they're checking their phone or just kind of absent-minded. What do you do in that moment? To the best of our ability, we'll try to engage them in conversation. I know there are some brokers, if a buyer's broker brings their buyers in and we're representing the seller, they try to act as a wall between the client and us, as if they're pulling the strings and they're controlling them. But the best brokers are those who realize we need to foster communication. If we can create a comfortable sense of environment in this space, that will leave with them. Because if it's tense or they're disconnected, uh, not to be too hippy dippy about it, but it really does affect the energy of the space. And you leave that thinking that's not for me even though it may have been for them so if we can engage them in conversation and find out this is a three-bedroom listing how many bedrooms do you need two okay great well here's the great thing about this other bedroom it could be a fantastic media room or an office or what else do you need mm -hmm. and then we try to help them go through their wish list and check off as many of the boxes as we can you two ready for the best ever lightning round oh uh -oh. boy oh boy <laughs> you're ready i i can tell <laughs> Okay, what's the best ever book you've read? <sighs> hmm, best ever book we've read. Well, from literature, I, not to be trite, but I am, a, I think I've read The Great Gatsby 14 times. So that's <laughs> <laughs> usually the one that's currently on the nightstand, which of course, being obsessed with Frank Sinatra is a Frank Sinatra uh, book. But um, I'm going to go back. You mentioned Barbara Corcoran earlier. And we kind of, you know, she's kind of a hero uh, to us. And she wrote a book um, several years ago called uh, if, if You Don't Have Large Breasts, Put Pigtails, mm -hmm. ribbons, in your, ribbons in Your Pigtails. Yeah. And again, it, it, it hysterically funny read uh, for anybody who does what we do for a living, they should read this book. And it kind of ties into our mantra of it's all show business and you've got to stand out. Mm, I love that. What is the best ever transaction that you've done? Well, I think we have to reference back to that, uh, that building in Harlem we were just talking about because that was, it's not always the highest grossing transactions that are the best ones. It's the ones where you come out of the trenches, you survived, and everybody is still reasonably happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's another one too. We, we sold a, a townhouse on the Upper West Side for another celebrity client. Uh, and it, it was a situation where we, we went in and we were the second broker and then and they had it priced at a nine or nine and a half million, uh, eight, and a half. eight and a half. They lowered the price. They were finally ready to move on. We went in, we won the listing. We raised the price to 12 million because it's not often where, where you go in and you say, this is underpriced. This is being approached from the wrong angle. We went in, we raised the price to 12 and we wound up closing and getting $11 million. That was like a record breaking deal at the time. The upper west side so what that, that what 
what specific aspect or aspects did you identify that it was under market so you raised the price? Uh, one of the cornerstones of our business is comps. We, people go by the numbers. So when you run what's sold in the last six months or the last year uh, of comparable properties, people come up with a price a dollar per square foot based on the quality of the space, the block, the renovation. And at that moment, when we looked at those numbers, we realized there's a gap here. This house is far better than anything in the eight and a half million dollar range or the nine million dollar range. So we broadened the search and we saw, we saw an opportunity, not in that neighborhood, but in other neighborhoods and the lines blur very quickly. And we thought we can do this. We can really get away with this. And we had half the brokers on the Upper West Side calling us, telling us we were insane. But there were a few uh, stalwart colleagues who came through that house and they said, you nailed it. You're exactly right. I'm bringing my people back. Wow. And they did. They brought, you know, rounds of buyers back over and over because they believe in the pricing. And certainly after that, uh, the closing price was posted, those same people were calling us. How did you do that? What did you do? What was it? Was, was something included with the sale? Was there extra furniture? We're like, no, we, we saw an opportunity in the market. We believe the market could, um, could bear that. And it did. So that forever changed the, the benchmark in that neighborhood for pricing in townhouses. Mm, that's impressive. What is the best ever way you two like to give back? We, we write checks to a bunch of different charities, but, but we, we really, our, our preference on this kind of a thing is to create, uh, to, to be very hands-on and create events mm -hmm. that we will host ourselves. We'll bring in like VIP clients to have an experience and to raise money for uh, you know, some of the charities that we support. Yeah, we're, uh, New York City real estate in particular is known for these glittering soirees designed to market properties. And what we like to do, wherever we can, where a seller has an organization that they believe in and they'd like to support, we try to find the tie-in with the property to raise money for that cause because people are more inclined to turn out if they feel there's some good to be done. So it, it's, it's great for our marketing efforts, but uh, more importantly than that, it's great exposure for those organizations. And then second to last question, what's, the, what, what's a, a mistake that you can think of that you've made on either a deal or just while in business? We don't make mistakes. <laughs> You're perfect. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, maybe that's maybe funny. we'll add that to one of your mistakes of answering the question. <laughs> One of, I, you know, one of our biggest mistakes is that we, we spend a lot of time making a lot of money for a lot of people, and we don't drink our own Kool-Aid. We look back sometimes, sometimes a buyer says, you guys are absolutely right, I'm doing it, and they make a lot of money. And sometimes they say, yeah, I, I don't believe you. And then five years later, we say, remember that place? It's tripled in value. And we've stopped recently and said, why don't we grab some of these opportunities ourselves. Why do we keep giving them away to other people? So that's a mistake that keeps, it happens over and over, but uh, we'll learn someday. <laughs> and lastly, where can the best ever listeners either reach out to you or your company? To, to reach us, uh, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. How do they find you online or wherever? TomandMickey.com. T-O-M-A-N-D-M-I-C-K-E-Y. Well, that's just perfect. And uh, that, that goes along with the theme, uh, that's for sure, of the, the, sh the show business theme of where you two stand out. And I love the analogy of looking at it the way a director looks at a script when you um, approach each proper property differently. And I, I've been taking notes throughout our conversation. I wrote down five primary rules that uh, that you two mentioned that you follow. One is buffer clients from the madness. So be a sponge for the drama. A two is total honesty and transparency, regardless of what's going down. Three is servicing the customer uh, first and foremost, and not necessarily being focused on making the deal. Four is to consistently evolve. And then five, and I love this one, is to put something in writing first. If something bad happens or unexpected and then call after it helps one the the individual 
digest the information and process it at their own speed in their own way. But then two, it allows you to formulate it the way it needs to be formulated and communicated um, so that you can think through it before sending it out. So really appreciate listening and having conversation with you two. Um, I have learned a lot. I know the best ever listeners have well have as well. I hope you two have a best ever day and we'll talk to you soon. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Pleasure.